author, columnist, managing editor of LibertyNation.com, podcast host and conservative policy advocate. We dismiss history at our peril. Liberty Nation Radio with Mark Angelides. We cannot be both the world's leading champion of peace and the world's leading supplier of the weapons of war. So said 39th President of the United States, Jimmy Carter. And it's a saying that bears particular relevance as America finds itself on the brink of a new nuclear arms race. Welcome back to Liberty Nation Radio here on the Radio America Network. I'm your host, Mark Angelides. On today's show, we talk Jimmy Carter, the Biden and Putin standoff, and all things liberty related. I want to take a moment just to say a special thank you to our listeners out in Dalton, Georgia on WBAC 1340 AM. Thank you for being here. And remember, this show is proudly sponsored by LibertyNation.com, where you can access podcasts, breaking news, analysis, and a range of biting and brilliant shows to whet your appetite for freedom and your fondness for the great American Constitution. As the 39th President of the United States, Jimmy Carter opts to receive hospice care rather than further medical treatment. At the time of recording, the former President is still with us and receiving outpourings of appreciation from Americans and world leaders alike. Now, we're very fortunate today to be joined by Liberty Nation's senior political analyst and longtime host of this here radio show, Tim Donner, who has some unique insight into the man himself and his legacy. Thanks for joining us today, Tim. Good to be here, as always, Mark. So, Tim, uh, at 98 years old, at time of recording, Jimmy Carter has been a, a notable political figure from his early days as a Georgia state senator to his later years as a, an elder statesman, particularly with uh, his, let's call it, charitable work. Um, what's your insight into the man and the president? Well, I think the way to summarize Jimmy Carter in the totality of his life was from political failure to personal triumph, because he was, by every account, a painfully failed president. His, I know you and I like numbers, uh, Mark, his approval dropped to the low 20s mm. during his presidency, and he lost 44 states to Ronald Reagan. It was a yeah, it was a full a landslide and a disgrace for him. But little did we know that he would treat the rest of his life almost as if he became president just so he could become a former president and use the capital that he had, the personal capital, because he was always personally liked, to do incredible works of charity most notably for Habitat for Humanity, which is a charitable organization that builds houses for the poor that he put on the map simply mm -hmm. by showing up and putting his shoulder to the wheel and doing manual labor to build houses. That sent a tremendous message. But as far as a president goes, I would liken his legacy somewhat to Donald Trump in the sense that he was elected in a year in the, perhaps the only year that he ever could have been elected because he was unheard of. We were just coming off of Watergate and the issue of corruption in Washington was ripe. It was a number one issue. Republicans had been trounced in the 1974 midterms after Ronald Reagan had resigned, um, excuse me, Richard Nixon had resigned. But let's say that the country was ripe for someone with a, the kind of simple, decent Christian morality that Carter brought to the job. Unfortunately, that sort of innocence turned to naivete, which turned to ineffectiveness. So this was his moment in time, and he capitalized. And just the story of him rising from an obscure Southern governor to vanquish, just like Trump, vanquished mm -hmm. a series of impressive candidates like Mo Udall and Scoop Jackson and Jerry Brown to win the primary. And he came out of it with a 20-point lead and barely hung on to beat Gerald Ford, but his problems began very soon after he came to Washington. Well, you know, that, that really does ring true, because there is the, the pervasive opinion of uh, President Carter that he had a, a terrible time in office, followed by an admirable post-presidency period. 
um, I guess, some of those issues that he had in office, which you correctly point out are due in large part to political naivety. Um, you've got the Iran hostage crisis that really uh, threw him for a loop towards the end there. You have the, the gas prices, you have the, the runaway inflation. It also, I believe that was also the period that uh, Paul Volcker got brought in uh, to the Fed, right? It was, and that sort of contributed to the uh, fairly rapid descent of the Carter administration. It's like so often happens, again, using the Trump analogy, that uh, what seemed refreshing and new and exciting about Trump in 2016, for many people, the, uh, the thrill was gone by 2020 because what was once new and fresh and exciting uh, had become quite the opposite. And that's what happened uh, with Jimmy Carter once they saw uh, what a presidency of this man was going to be like. It didn't, it, it never panned out. And I mean, only Herbert Hoover uh, was defeated more soundly in his bid for re-election. Hey, Tim, I, I believe you've got a personal story about Jimmy Carter. I do, and it's a hysterical one, because one of the things that distinguished Ronald Reagan and some others, including Obama, uh, Barack Obama, is as presidents, they had pretty well-developed senses of humor. They knew when they could be light and they would get the assembled mass of either media or people to laugh at their at their humor. Jimmy Carter was not a guy who was humorous really at all. And yet the one encounter that I had with him during the 1976 campaign, which I was pretty heavily involved in, I was very active on the campus at Syracuse University in that campaign, but I had gone to Eugene, Oregon, for the uh, wedding of my sister. We get to the hotel in Eugene. It's a Saturday afternoon, and we are dressed to the nines. We're dressed in formal wear. And I had forgotten that that was the same weekend before, as be right before the Oregon primary. So Jimmy Carter was in town. And as we came down to the lobby, we stopped and stood there because here was Jimmy Carter coming the other way. I said, guys, this is Jimmy Carter. He stops. He looks at us in our Sunday best, in our formal wear, and says, famously, this has become a family legend. My, this is the most formal town I've ever seen. <laughs> and that, <laughs> Because uh, it was a Saturday afternoon in Oregon, and here's yep. these people in formal wear in a hotel lobby. And so we all laughed, shook his hand, and of course, he flashed his famous Carter grin at us mm. and then moved on. And won that primary, by the way, and went on to win the nomination in the election. Here we are. We're talking uh, the life and times of former President Jimmy Carter. Later in the show, we're going to discuss the nuclear arms race. But we'll be back with Tim after this short break discussing Jimmy Carter's presidential performance. Don't go anywhere. We dismiss history at our peril. Liberty Nation Radio with Mark Angelides. With the gas price explosion and raging inflation, a number of commentators have made the comparison between the presidencies of Joe Biden and Jimmy Carter. Now, is this a fair description? Well, we're back with Tim Donner providing a unique perspective on the life and times of the 39th president. Now, Tim, it, it's normal to compare current presidents with their predecessors. Um, what similarities do you see between Carter and Biden? Well, I think particularly over from the point of Afghanistan forward that Biden has been perceived as, uh, let's put it this way, a president who could be taken advantage of by foreign powers. And I think we saw, I mean, Joe Biden is getting a lot of kudos for going to Ukraine and standing with President Zelensky. But at the same time, if you look during the four years that Donald Trump was president, Putin 
made no moves mm. on Ukraine. He had moved on Georgia during the uh, during the Bush forty three administration. Uh, he had moved on two other places, including a part of Ukraine mm. during the Obama administration. But he behaved himself during the Trump years. I think it's not a coincidence that the moment that Trump left office and Biden became president, that the Russians began a buildup, a military buildup on the Ukrainian border. And likewise, in 1979, there was clearly the sense that the Russians uh, perceived Carter as weak. And why wouldn't they? Americans did. So the Soviets picked up on that very quickly and they invaded Afghanistan. That in turn forced Carter in his mind to boycott the Olympics, and he had no real response other than verbally. And the sense was he was sort of in over his head. And the same thing uh, has been said of Biden for different reasons, because of age and a cognitive decline, and the general sense, given all the gaffes that he makes, that he's just kind of barely keeping it together. And it was the same with Carter, even though he was a young, energetic, and well-liked president but there was a clear sense that he was in over his head and i think that that was probably typified by when he gave the so-called malaise speech during the last full year of his presidency uh in which he essentially blamed the american people for a crisis of spirit and sort of shed the blame from himself for the myriad problems that he had which were on the foreign front most prominently beyond Afghanistan, of course, was the hostage crisis. And so many people felt he needed to end it, no matter the cost of human life to the American hostages. Uh, other people admired him for his persistence in insisting that not a single hostage die. And ultimately, they might call it a success uh, because the moment that he turned the keys to the Oval Office over to Ronald Reagan, uh, the hostages were released. Uh, so there's just a sense, I think, too, that, you know, Biden is a guy that the Democrats turned to because it was nobody else. And I think by the time Carter was elected, a lot of his flaws had already sort of been unmasked during the uh, general election campaign in 1976. But Ford, Gerald Ford had pardoned Richard Nixon and was behind by 20 points. And so Carter barely held on. And the conventional wisdom at the time among those people like myself who studied this stuff closely was if the election had gone on another week, uh, Carter would have lost because all the momentum was with Ford. Uh, but the presidencies compare in the sense that they are, you know, a response to something dramatic that happened right before them. Joe Biden was a response to Donald Trump and the hatred that maybe 40 to 45 percent of the country had, mm -hmm. the vile hatred for Trump, the same way uh, that set the stage for Biden to sort of uh, uh, claim that he'll bring a return to so-called normalcy. Uh, likewise, Jimmy Carter promised a return to normalcy from the from the stink of the Watergate affair and the and the uh, Richard Nixon resignation. So and I think there are clear similarities and we'll find out if Biden runs for reelection, whether the similarities run to a lack of success in seeking reelection. I think there's certainly a, a major difference in terms of how presidents are portrayed through the media now certainly we we have had yellow journalism as it's called for a very very long time um but the modern iteration it appears to be uh all absolving and not shy of uh, a little revisionist history when it comes to the facts now how do you think this modern age journalistic machine will view jimmy carter it's a complicated legacy because I mean, his flaws were obvious. You don't have to dig too deep to see the flaws in terms of a general lack of leadership, weakness in foreign policy. 
an inability to react to an economic crisis, a multi-level economic crisis. At the same time, one of the few things, one of the things few people realize is that the military buildup uh, that was credited to, and rightly, uh, Ronald Reagan during his eight years, uh, which led to the, the basically the destruction of the Soviet Union, um, that it was actually begun by Jimmy Carter in 1980 in response to the Russian invasion of Afghanistan. So he deserves at least some credit in reacting realistically to the Soviet threat. At the same time, he did some very good regulatory things in streamlining government, trying to make it more efficient, trying to cut the bureaucracy. And he was opposed as much by his own swamp dwelling ver- uh, party. Uh, yeah. as he was by Republicans in many sense. His problem was that his support uh, during the campaign was what we call a mile wide and an inch deep. People supported him, just like Biden. He, they supported him. They were going to vote for him because he was not the other person. Um, but when he became president, that didn't give him much of a stronghold. And he came marching into Washington with his own people. Uh, Hamilton Jordan, Jody Powell, those are the two most famous of the Georgia mafia, so to speak, that he brought in to Washington. And they just refused to cooperate with the swamp. Again, like Trump, he had his own ideas of zero-based budgeting, for example, where the government would be brought to a zero budget and be forced to defend every penny they spent. Unfortunately, he had so many proposals that there was there was an inability to focus on a larger question. He didn't have an Obamacare, for example, where Obama focused all the attention on that single initiative to try and get it done, and he succeeded. With Carter, there were a hundred different things he was trying to do, but there wasn't any one thing that he could uh, lead the American people to. He will go down as, I think, in history, there's no question, uh, as he did mostly at the time, putting together a remarkable peace deal between Egypt and Israel, Mm -hmm. Sadat, and Begin, and of course, Anwar Sadat wound up uh, sacrificing his life for it because he was later assassinated. That was an extraordinary uh, accomplishment and one that took the kind of detail-oriented person, tireless kind of person like Carter, shuttling back and forth, shuttle diplomacy between the two leaders at Camp David. Uh, in order to get the deal done. And that set the framework for, again, with Trump, mm. what later became the Abraham Accords. Yeah, the David Accords to the Abraham, Abraham yes. Accords. Yes. Yep. Okay, Tim Donner, thanks ever so much for your insight. Much appreciated. It's been a lot of fun. Thanks, Mark. Uh, later in the show, we talk liberty with Scott D. Casenza. But up next, after this short break, we discuss the coming nuclear arms race. Don't go anywhere. We dismiss history at our peril. Liberty Nation Radio with Mark Angelides. With Russian President Vladimir Putin pulling out of the last remaining treaty with the US, specifically the New START treaty aimed at limiting the number of nuclear weapons either side has, questions abound regarding the possibility of a nuclear arms race. Now, what is the White House response and how safe is the world in this bright new world order? Well, we're fortunate to have with us former Deputy Undersecretary of Defense Controller Dave Patterson, who just happens to have a take on this particular topic. Thanks for being here, Dave. Thank you, Mark. Happy to be with you. So, Dave, uh, tell me, are we at the beginning of a new nuclear arms race? Well, I think we could be easily because, uh, you know, the Russians have done the one thing that kind of held everything together, and that was they stopped all of the inspections that uh, take place that were part of the New START treaty. And uh, so that, that that's somewhat uh, of a problem for the United States. Not so much that it was actually uh, substantive, it was more symbolic, but in that symbol, there was some, uh, there was some uh, comfort, I guess, uh, 
Uh, Secretary of State Blinken called it irresponsible to do that. So uh, we have basically the the U.S. position on that. Okay, and just for our listeners, the just to clarify this, the New Start Treaty uh, essentially laid down that the two countries could only have a, a certain amount of intercontinental nuclear warheads and carriers for those specific warheads, and that. It was those that were uh, able to be inspected by each side's respective policy units. Is that about right? Uh, that's correct. Uh, yes, that's what uh, the uh, that's what the treaty established back in 2011. Uh, and you know, it's been reasonably uh, effective, as I said, more symbolic than substantive, uh, in as much as the Russians have turned their nuclear capability back to uh, intermediate range ballistic missiles, which holds uh, Europe, obviously, uh, at, at, in a threat environment. Um, but I think it's interesting to note that on the same day that uh, President Putin, Russian President Putin, uh, announced that he was uh, ditching the uh, New START Treaty, they uh, attempted a an ICBM test, which failed. Uh, so not a good look for pulling out of the treaty. Yeah, I, I'm reminded of the, uh, the the Moscow rules era, though, where pretty much everything was a deception or a feint or a slight. So uh, the idea that this particular uh, missile test would take place, I, I, be, I believe there are conflicting views on did it take place at the time when Biden was in Ukraine or, or just before. But uh, yeah, it seems to me that it, that there was a lot of, uh, propaganda hinging on that, e- either if it were successful or or if it weren't. And let, let's talk about Joe Biden for a moment here. So uh, it seems to me that he didn't respond to this in Poland. He didn't respond to Putin's withdrawal from the treaty. Uh, and this, I don't know, does this seem to be a, a recurrent theme of ignoring problems until they, they reach a boiling point where they have to be dealt with? Well, I think, you know, he had practiced his speech and to add something else to it was was a bit over the top for him. But uh, I think it's it's really Im- important to realize that uh, what President Biden was there to do was to uh, insure, re- reassure the uh, people from, of the Ukraine and Poland and uh, other NATO countries that border on uh, the conflict areas that the United States was there to, uh, to uh, for them and was not going to uh, to, to leave them in, in the lurch, and I believe he did that. Uh, it's it's not clear to me whether or not um, he even knew that uh, Putin had uh, pulled out of start, but we'll say that he did and chose not to mention it. And I think that's you know uh, that's kind of important. I mean. I would think it would be a big deal, but, uh, you know, we can only focus on one thing at a time. Apparently, with uh, tens of thousands of staff at Foggy Bottom, only one uh, crisis can be dealt with. And uh, I'm not entirely sure which crisis they are dealing with at the moment, uh, Foggy Bottom, but uh, we we will find out, I'm sure. Now, from a defense perspective, Dave, um, what should the U.S. be doing now? And and more importantly, to append to this question um would whatever actions the u.s take now just lead to an escalation of uh building buying uh, creating more nuclear weapons well the united states has had a uh, a fairly consistent yet probably not adequate uh, approach to uh, modernizing its nuclear capability Whereas Russia has uh, completed about 80% of its uh, modernization of its total nuclear capacity and capability, the United States has not. In fact, uh, it's not expected to have a full modernization of the programs that are currently ongoing until the 2030s. And uh, so there's a problem there and what the united states should do is say okay fine we get it you know you've decided to uh ditch the treaty that kind of held everything in check so game on and uh so we have a a new uh a nuclear bomber the b21 raider and it just rolled out this year 
And but it won't be uh, fully operationally capable until uh, toward the end of uh, you know the the twenty twenties. And uh, we also have uh, a number of other programs. Uh, the replacement for the Minuteman three uh, ICBMs. We have a command and control, but none of these are are moving along at a pace that would be competitive. I think with uh, with the Russians. So. To compress that timeline, to speed that stuff up uh, and to get on the page, uh, I think that that's what the United States should do. And we've been hearing a lot about a, a more formal relationship uh, regards to this, this war from China. Now, uh, Anthony Blinken, Secretary of State, he, he, he warned at his recent Beijing visit that uh, as well as providing non-lethal aid, he suspected that the Chinese Communist Party was either on the brink of providing lethal aid to Russia or was already doing so. Now, uh, how credible was Blinken's words? And I, I think from a wider perspective, is that any different to what the US is doing for Ukraine? I, I think that um, you have to take uh, Secretary Blinken uh, in, in context with how successful he's been in the past, and that has not been very. Uh, you know, basically, when he talks to uh, the Chinese and his counterparts, it just simply becomes an opportunity for theater for them to put their point across and to dismiss uh, Secretary Blinken full cloth. So I don't think uh, whatever he had to say, he simply you know, made his point about the United States not wishing to see uh, China provide lethal aid to uh, Russia, but there's no consequence to them doing it, and they know that. Um, I think that on your with your other question, I think that what uh, President Biden brought up in his speech where he announced 500 million uh, more American taxpayers going to the Ukraine is a more troubling problem, and that is the administration continues to say However it, much it takes in the way American taxpayers' dollars are spent in Ukraine, and no matter how long it takes, these are troubling concepts. And as much as the president railed against the forever war in Afghanistan, it would appear to me that he's laying the groundwork, setting the stage for another forever war at American taxpayers' expense. I think, yeah, Mark, you, you know, we have to realize that it is in America's interest to um, protect Ukraine from the Russian invasion. And what you don't hear about very often, and what's really, I think, important, is that we are keeping the hostilities off our shores. We are keeping the battle somewhere else. And that's very important in terms of the deterrence and safety and national security uh, for the Americans uh, and, and the U.S. public. And we don't hear much about that. We, you know, we, we hear, you know, basically uh, uh, platitudes about freedom in Ukraine. But the more important thing is that we're keeping the Russians in, in their uh, neighborhood. Yeah, I know that um, Afghanistan has long been known as the, the graveyard of empires, but I would I would argue that Russia is very much uh, of a similar scope and scale in that historical regard. Dave Patterson, thank you ever so much for joining us. Hey, Mark, great to be with you, as always. We dismiss history at our peril. Liberty Nation Radio with Mark Angelides. Alec Baldwin gets a semi-legal pass. Google and Twitter in court. All these things, what do they have in common? Well, they're all about liberty. And to discuss liberty, we are joined by Uprising podcast host, legal affairs editor, and man about town, Mr. Scott DiCosenza, Esquire. We must add the Esquire because it gives weight to your very weighty already opinions. Welcome back, Scott. Thank you so much, Mark. All right, now, Scott, obviously, the big news on this week, uh, which for some reason uh, it, America is just fascinated with is Alec Baldwin gets a minor legal victory. Now, I'm not entirely sure why we care about uh, an actor quite you have so mis much. You have misstated it, Mark. It is a major legal victory for Alec Baldwin, not a minor one. And we do love our celebrity 
celebrity in that justice case, I care about it more because it's a major win. But yeah. tell me, what's the liberty aspect here, and what what happened for Mr. Bolden? Well, th- this has a kind of a, an interesting legal hook uh, a- as well for those that are uh, fond of and interested in sort of off more offbeat legal stories. Alec Baldwin was charged uh, last month, I think, is when the official charging uh, documents went in uh, out of um, District at First Judicial District Attorney Mary Carmack Altwise, uh, who handles cases in Santa Fe and other areas of New Mexico where uh, Alec Baldwin was holding the gun that fatally shot uh, Helena Hutchins, the cinematographer on his film Rust. Now, you'll notice I didn't say that he shot her. Uh, I framed it in the manner that Mr. Baldwin has said, which is that he didn't touch the trigger. He says that, you know, he was holding the gun and it went off. Now, let's leave that part aside. I think that's probably not true, uh, knowing what we know about physics and firearms. Uh, But with respect to these charges, Mr. Baldwin was charged with a firearms enhancement to his uh, Mm -hmm. manslaughter charge, which would have added a mandatory minimum of five years on top of any other uh, uh, time. And that is now off the table. So he's gone Just from... Just to clarify that, the firearm enhancement is, yeah. uh, it's a legal tool that adds extra to a sentence because a firearm is involved. So it's, it's not, there's yes. an enhancement on the particular firearm. It's an enhancement. Of oh, that sentence. would be so cool. I hadn't thought about it in that, in that respect, Mark, you know, it's not an enhanced firearm in any, in any case, it is, it is a, it is a vehicle by which our betters in the legislature have, have chosen to apply a lever to people who are using firearms in crimes that they don't do so because of obviously uh, the deadly nature of firearms. So in order to, in order to, to, uh, disincentivize that they add more time. But the problem is the bill that allows for that firearms enhancement was passed into law after the shooting itself, creating a classic ex post facto law. Now this is not something Mark, a, a criminal defense attorney, you know, is, is part of their stock in trade. We, we don't generally see arguments uh, about ex post facto laws because they're not generally, uh, you know, part of our, you know, ordinary criminal legal practice. But that's what would happen here. Um, and it's really an embarrassment for uh, for the DA's office because just a month after they charged him, or not even, they're withdrawing these charges because of the ex post facto uh, arguments that Baldwin's lawyers have made and I think ultimately would be successful at. So the the case just went from, gee, Worst case scenario, I have to spend a minimum of over five years in prison to worst case scenario, I think it's uh, 18 months now is the maximum. So, And that maximum, that's for a manslaughter charge, of which there yes. are obviously several different variants. Now, I, I and, think- many- And let me, let me just add one thing, if I might, which is that, you know, one of the things we have to think about is it's not just those numbers themselves which color Baldwin's current legal position because he's now only at a maximum of 18 months, it's much more uh, likely and more politically feasible for the whole system if he pleads to a sentence that does not include uh, any uh, incarceration. So I think that's much more likely. He's in a more powerful bargaining position and the DA is in a much, uh, much less powerful bargaining position. So the, the results of these bargainings, uh, they would entail some kind of admission of li- likely admission of guilt for manslaughter is that well, right that, that that is if a plea uh if a plea is entered if a plea is entered now we have no evidence yet in 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 sort of public discourse that uh baldwin is considering a plea except that i can tell you for with 100 percent certainty that that is a conversation that any criminal defense attorney would have uh with his client because if you go to trial you might lose a trial no matter what, uh, you know, no matter how things look going into it, uh, there's always the possibility of loss of trial. So it's an important conversation uh, to have. I, I think from the, the layman's point of view, I, th- I think many people are quite shocked by this, that the manslaughter carries 18 months, but the weapons enhancement thing, that's five years. So if you are going to commit manslaughter, do it with any other thing in the entire planet other than a firearm right yeah well the 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 enhancement for well first of all 
let me grant your yes that's that's preposterous right so why yeah. is that the case but also and the re- true <laughs> and the, it is true and the reason why it's true is because the enhancement wasn't authored by the legislature to enhance uh, uh crimes to enhance sentences with respect to manslaughter specifically it was all felonies basically that aren't capital cases and manslaughter happens to be one of them so it just got caught up in that net mark rather than specifically targeted uh for that purpose and can i ask are there people who uh are already incarcerated who will be who will benefit from this ex post facto position uh almost certainly no um this is oh, this only is, only alec baldwin gets benefit <laughs> well, here you know uh there when when celebrities get charged and go on trial uh these da's oftentimes get uh get wacky you know they're not they're not used to uh, to the celebrity, I, I wrote about this, of course, uh, for the pages of LibertyNation.com, and I mentioned that uh, Ms. Carmack Altweiss announced her charges via Twitter and used hashtags mm. to delineate the people involved and not their actual given name. So she didn't say, we charged Alec Baldwin with this crime. She said, we charged hashtag, hashtag. Alec Baldwin, whatever his Twitter <laughs> handle is. So, uh, yeah, it's well, professionalism is clearly alive and well in the American legal system. <laughs> now, Scott, very briefly, I just want to touch hey on now. what's happening uh, in the Supreme Court this last week. Uh, so we have uh, both Google and Twitter are up uh, before the essentially arguing before the court uh, against being. And here's the thing. It, it's it, many people have. Uh, been on twitter for example and uh social media saying this is about overturning section 230 of the communications act which isn't correct is it it's just about whether these two giant companies can be sued is that about right in both cases there are uh people who want to uh get money from google and get money from twitter uh, for things that basically other people have posted in the way that information has been presented. Those companies have said, we don't even have to defend ourselves to that to that type of suit because of Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, which gives us li- uh, basically a grant of immunity from, from that defense. And what the plaintiffs have said is, oh, no, you don't. You don't get to claim that liability here because of some peculiar, I think, uh, uh, legal theories but that's that is what the case is about and, and if they lose they won't necessarily lose that liability part then they'll have to go fight those claims which are onerous and expensive to fight which is why they they obviously want to stop stop the ball here yeah from what i gather it's that uh they're, they're suing that the, the base of the argument for the plaintiffs is that the algorithm that somebody would watch uh then promotes something of a similar value. So in this case, it was uh, somebody who was killed by ISIS terrorists. Well, it, it's curious that you use the and, word promote because one of one of the one of the issues in the case is whether it is a promotion or a suggestion or just some grant of wish that if you've searched on cat videos and I give you not just you know one cat video, but but a list of cat mm-hmm. videos is the order and the ranking of those lists. Is that me publishing new information or am I just granting you your your search request i think this is a question that will become more and more crucial though as ai sort of moves forward into controlling uh, how things are, are dealt with in a public face from private companies uh scott de thanks ever so much for joining us thank you mark and that's almost all we have time for on this week's edition of liberty nation radio here on the radio america network I'd like to thank our guests, Tim Donner, Dave Patterson, and Scott DiCasenza for being on the show. And also thanks to you, the constant listener, for taking the time to tune in week on week. Uh, At the time of recording, Jimmy Carter remains in hospice care. So I'll leave you with the words of his vice president, Walter Mondale, as the two men left the White House. He said of their partnership, we told the truth, we obeyed the law, we kept the peace. And I think we can all agree that regardless of everything else, That's not a bad legacy to leave behind. We dismiss history at our peril. Liberty Nation Radio with Mark Angelides. Entertaining, informative, and just plain fun. Watch Liberty Nation's The Conservative Five. 
produced by conservatives for conservatives. C5 is the left free zone, hosted by Liberty Nation's Hi, Lisa K. K. Donner, joined by a raucous, irreverent panel Maggie of authors, friendly. deconstructing the leftist narratives, down. debating the hot, hot topics, topics. and remembering to laugh. <laughs> Join the official conservative safe space. You only did that to piss Jeff Liberty off. Liberty Nation's The Conservative Five.